Oral Cavity This chapter provides an overview of the anatomy of the oral cavity as it would be observed in an oral examination. In addition, some pertinent clinical aspects of the variations in normal anatomy of the oral cavity are addressed where appropriate. Subsequent chapters detail regional dissections pertinent to a thorough understanding of the anatomic structures of the head and neck. The oral cavity, mouth, is the entry portal of the digestive system. It is bounded anteriorly by the lips and posteriorly by the oropharyngeal isthmus, isthmus fossium, a more or less circular aperture that guards the entrance to the pharynx. The oral cavity is lined with mucous membrane composed of stratified squamous epithelium and an underlying dense, irregular, collagenous connective tissue that houses minor salivary glands. For purposes of description, the oral cavity is subdivided into two major regions, the outer vestibule and the inner oral cavity proper. Lips, the highly vascular fleshy lips guard the entrance to the mouth. The red vermilion zone gives way to mucous membrane leading into the oral cavity. The lips are two fleshy, mobile structures guarding the entrance to the mouth. They are covered externally with skin that overlease muscle, glands, and connective tissue. Internally they are lined with a mucous membrane. The red portion of the lips, whose coloration is caused by a rich vascular bed vialcible through the thin epithelium, is termed the vermilion zone. Because it is not a wet membrane, it must be kept moistened with the tongue to prevent drying. The skin and vermilion zone join at the vermilion border. The superior lip is bounded laterally by the nasolabial groove extending from the allal wing, of the nose to a short distance lateral to the corner of the mouth. A slight shallow, vertical depression in the midline from the nose to the vermilion border is the philtrum cupid's bow, and just inferior to this depression is the labial tubercle, a fleshy bump of varying size in the vermilion zone the inferior lip is separated from the chin by the labiomental groove. The two lips are connected laterally by the labial commissures, which are thin folds of tissue that are easily viewed when the mouth is slightly opened. Occasionally a slight depression ls noted l and the center of the labial commissure, known as the commissural. Anatomy of the lips and adjacent area. 1. Filtrum, 2. Commissural lip pit. 3. Vermilion zone, 4. Vermilion border, 5. Labial commissure, 6. Labial tubercle. Lip pit. The oral fissure, rima of the mouth, is the zone between the superior and inferior lips, which may be opened or, when the two lips are in contact with each other, closed. The lips develop from several sources, including the median nasal, intermaxillary segment, maxillary, and mandibular processes. Many of the structures just described are fusion remnants of these embryologic origins and often become more pronounced with advancing age. A more detailed description of the development and congenital deformities of the LLPS is presented in Chapter 5. Vestibule The vestibule is the space between the lips and the cheeks external to the teeth in occlusion. The vestibule is the cleft or space between the lips and cheeks externally and the teeth and gingiva of the dental arches internally when the teeth are in occlusion. The vestibule communicates with the exterior through the oral fissure of the lips and with the oral cavity proper via the interdental spaces and the interval posterior to the last molar teeth in each dental arch. Laterally, the vestibule is referred to as the buccal vestibule, whereas anteriorly, in the region of the lips, it is termed the labial vestibule. The mucobuccal and slash or mucolabial folds, fornix, represent the location point at which the regionally named vestibular mucosa turns to become the alveolar mucosa. Located lips, cleft lip, often associated with cleft alveolar and primary palate, is the result of a developmental defect and occurs in approximately 1 in 1,000 births. Congenital commissural lip pits may be observed infrequently at the angle of the mouth in the commissure. These are remnants of development and are not clinically significant. The mouth from corner to corner normally spans between the first premolar teeth. As the mouth is opened the oral fissure becomes an oval to circular aperture. Abnormally large superior labial frenula may invade the interdental space between the maxillary central incisors, thus causing a large diastema. This may be relieved by severing the frenula, phrenectomy. If after a reasonable time the diastema persists, 
orthodontic treatment may be necessary. In the superior labial vestibule is the incisive fossa represented by a shallow depression superior to the incisor teeth. The bulge extending into the labial vestibule from the alveolar ridge over the root of the superior canine tooth is the canine eminence, whereas the shallow depression just lateral to it is the canine fossa protruding into the roof of the buccal vestibule in the vicinity of the first molar is the zygomatic process of the maxilla. This structure may easily be palpated. The nearly vertical anterior border of the masseter muscle may also be palpated in the posterior buccal vestibule because it extends from the angle of the mandible to the zygomatic arch. The region of the maxilla posterior to the zygomatic process and superior to the last molar is the maxillary tuberosity. This is an important area anatomically because it serves as an injection site for anesthesia of the posterior superior alveolar nerve. The parotid gland empties its salivary secretions into the buccal vestibule at a small orifice opposite the second maxillary molar. This opening, which appears elevated in the mucosa, is the parotid papilla, stenson duct. Several other small minor salivary glands that are regionally named for example, the buccal glands and labial glands also open into the vestibule via microscopic openings. In most individuals, Small yellow spots may be observed in the buccal mucosa lateral to the corner of the lips. These are four dice granules, composed of defunct sebaceous glands that became trapped in the mucosa during development. Extra reflections of labial mucosa appear as folds of tissue in the midline attaching the superior and inferior lips to the gingiva. These are the labial frenula, syngfrenulum, where the superior labial frenulum is the most prominent. Often, Additional frenula may be observed in the labial and buccal vestibules. Occasionally, the superior labial frenulum is so broadly attached that it interferes with normal eruption of the central incisors, thereby producing a diastema. Correction of this condition usually requires surgical removal of the frenulum between the central incisors to permit the teeth to return to the normal shape. The gingiva, gum, is covered by the gingival mucosa which folds back on itself to form a free edge, known as the gingival margin, which surrounds the inferior margin of the clinical crowns of the teeth. The vestibular gingiva in this region becomes continuous with the gingiva of the oral cavity proper. The interdental papilla lies between the teeth in the interdental spaces, and the retromolar papilla is that specialized area of the gingiva distal to the last molars in both dental arches. The coronal most aspect of the interdental papilla of the molar region usually possesses a concavity known as the kernel gingival mucosa is pale pink and stippled in good oral health. The alveolar mucosa overlies the alveolar mucolabial fold, 6, canine eminence, 7, free gingival groove. Processes of both the maxillary and mandibular arches. Its red hue is caused by the visibility of its vascularity through the non-keratinized epithelium of its mucosa. Where the alveolar mucosa blends into the remaining vestibular mucosa is not easily distinguished. However, a rather sharp, scalloped line, the mucogingival junction, separates the gingival mucosa from the alveolar mucosa. The oral cavity, the oral cavity proper is that part of the oral cavity lying internal to the dental arches of each jaw and their surrounding gingiva. It is bounded superiorly by the palate and inferiorly by the muscular tongue. The oral cavity proper lies internal to the dental arches and their contained dentition and gingiva. It is bounded superiorly by the palate and inferiorly by the muscular tongue and reflections of the mucous membrane extending from the mandibular gingiva in the sublingual sulcus lagrival to the base of the tongue. Anterolaterally, it is bounded by the lingual surfaces of the teeth, lingual gingiva, and lingual alveolar mucosa. The posterior boundary of the oral cavity proper is formed by the vertical portion of the soft palate superiorly and by the anterior pillar of the fosses, the palatoglossal arch. This arch, which includes the palatoglossus muscle and overlying oral mucosa, extends from the soft palate to the sides of the base of the tongue. Vestibule, a fold of mucosa in the posterior most boundary of the vestibule connecting the maxillary and mandibular alveolar regions covers the pterygomandibular raphe. The raphe is a tendinous inscription between the buccinator and superior constrictor muscles that is attached to the pterygoid hamulus and the area of the retromolar triangle of the mandible. 
the superior labial frenulum frequently possesses a tag of tissue located on its anterior surface approximately midway between its attachments at the lip and gingiva. This tissue lends an irregular surface to the frenulum. This small mass is non-pathologic and may be regarded as a hyperplastic anomaly. The region of the buccal mucosa adjacent to the mandibular retromolar papilla contains an aggregation of accessory buccal glands that results in a prominence in the mucosa. This, along with the retromolar papilla, is often referred to incorrectly as the retromolar pad. Occasionally, a white line, the linea alba, may be observed on the buccal mucosa representing that area of the mucosa in close proximity to the occlusal surfaces when the jaws are in the closed position. The space of the vestibule is somewhat reduced when the mouth is opened by the forward movement of the coronoid process of the mandible as its condyle moves forward and downward. This may interfere with dental radiographic procedures in the maxillary molar area and in preparing study models and making maxillary dentures. The masseter muscle also impinges on the vestibular space as the mouth is closed and teeth are clenched. The anterior edge of this muscle may be palpated in the clenched position by inserting a finger in the buccal vestibule. The presence of this muscle must be taken into account when fitting a mandibular prosthesis. Communication of the oral cavity proper with the vestibule has been discussed previously, now its communication with the pharynx will be described. The oral cavity communicates with the oral pharynx via the oropharyngeal isthmus, the fossas. This aperture is bounded by the soft palate superiorly, by the mucosa in close proximity to the occlusal surfaces when the jaws are in the closed position. The space of the vestibule is somewhat reduced when the mouth is opened by the forward movement of the coronoid process of the mandible as its condyle moves forward and downward. This may interfere with dental radiographic procedures in the maxillary molar area and in preparing study models and making maxillary dentures. The masseter muscle also impinges on the vestibular space as the mouth is closed and teeth are clenched. The anterior edge of this muscle may be palpated in the clenched position by inserting a finger in the buccal vestibule. The presence of this muscle must be taken into account when fitting a mandibular prosthesis. The surface of the posterior one third of the tongue inferiorly, and by the palatoglossal arch laterally. Anything posterior to these named structures lies in the pharynx. For example, the palatine tonsil lies in a tonsillar crypt between the palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arches. Thus, the palatine tonsil is considered to be in the pharynx because its position is posterior to the palatoglossal arch. The tongue, the tongue, lying in the floor of the oral cavity proper, is divided into a body and a base. The tongue, a muscular organ, is divided for descriptive purposes into the body, which lies relatively free in the oral cavity, and the base, which is fixed to the hyoid bone. The base spans the oral cavity and pharynx. The dorsum of the body possesses the median sulcus, a shallow groove superficially dividing the tongue longitudinally in the midline into right and left halves. The surface mucosa exhibits specialized zones demarcating the remnants of the embryologic origin of the tongue. The sulcus terminalis may be observed as a posteriorly directed, V-shaped shallow groove separating the anterior two-thirds, or body, from the posterior one-third, base, of the tongue. The terminal sulcus is the developmental dividing line. That is, anything anterior to it is in the oral cavity, whereas anything posterior to it is in the pharynx. The posterior one-third and base will be described here because they may be observed when the tongue is protruded, as in an oral examination. Lying alongside but anterior to the terminal sulcus is a row of 8 to 10 mushroom-shaped circumvallate papillae vallate papillae. These structures possess taste buds and receive the ducts of the serous glands of von Ebner, one of the few named groups of minor accessory salivary glands. The remaining mucosal surface of the dorsum of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue possesses specialized projections, known as lingual papillae. The most numerous are the filiform papillae and, interspersed among them are the mushroom-shaped fungiform papillae, the former present a rough surface and they present no taste buds, whereas the latter display a few taste buds on their dorsal surface. On the posterolateral aspect of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue are vertical furrows known as the foliate papillae, their taste buds degenerate after the first couple of years of life.
located in the midline, just posterior to the apex of the sulcus, is the foramen cecum, a shallow, pit-like depression that is a remnant of the developmental thyroglossal duct. The rest of the dorsal surface of the posterior one-third of the tongue exhibits irregular bulges in its mucosa representing the lingual tonsils. The mucosa of the ventral surface of the tongue is smooth and without surface papillae. The medially placed lingual frenulum attaches the anterior two-thirds of the tongue to the floor of the mouth. On either side of the frenulum, extending almost to the tip of the tongue, surface bulges may be observed representing the underlying glands of Blandin nun, another group of the named, minor accessory salivary glands. These glands are mixed, producing both serous and mucous saliva, which empty into the oral cavity via several minute pores. The bilateral deep lingual veins may be observed through the nearly transparent mucosa on either side of the frenulum coursing just deep to the mucosa along the tongue's inferior surface from the tip to the deep regions in the floor of the mouth, where the vein disappears from view. Lateral to the vein is a fringed fold of mucous membrane, the plica fimbriata, which often exhibits tissue tags from its free edge. Ducts of the glands of Blandin nun open into the oral cavity through the fringes of the plica fimbriata. Just above the floor of the mouth on either side of the lingual frenulum is an elevation of the mucous membrane, plica sublingualis, overlying the bulging sublingual glands. On closer examination one may observe several small openings along the surface of the plica sublingualis representing the small sublingual ducts, ducts of rivenous. In addition, a large sublingual duct, duct of Bartholin, from the sublingual gland joins the submandibular duct, Wharton duct, just before its entry into the oral cavity for the delivery of saliva from the submandibular gland. The Wharton duct empties at the sublingual caruncula, an enlarged papilla adjacent to the lingual frenulum. Incisive glands, a small group of minor accessory salivary glands, may also be found on the floor of the oral cavity on either side of the lingual frenulum just posterior to the mandibular incisors. The palate, forms the roof of the oral cavity and is composed of the anterior hard palate and the posterior soft palate. The palate, representing the roof of the oral cavity, is divided into the hard palate, comprising the anterior two-thirds, and the soft palate, comprising the remaining posterior one-third. Mucoperiosteum covers part of the bony skeleton of the hard palate, whereas mucous membrane covers the muscular soft palate. Anterolaterally, the palatal mucosa blends into the alveolar and gingival mucosae surrounding the lingual surface of the maxillary teeth. Posteriorly, the palate blends into the anterior and posterior pillars of the fosses laterally. The free posterior border of the soft palate terminates in the inferiorly directed uvula, located in the midline. The palatine velum is that area of the soft palate represented by the superiorly placed posterior free margin and the laterally placed pillars of the fosses. Tongue, normally, the tongue varies considerably in size and surface presentation, and this variation is often the result of developmental abnormalities. Some of the more common inconsequential anomalies are microglossia, small tongue, macroglossia, large tongue, fissured tongue, excessive fissures in dorsum, median rhomboid glossitis, an area devoid of lingual papilla, crenated tongue, indentations along the margins pressing on the teeth in occlusion. Other anomalies exist, particularly in the lingual papilla, which manifest themselves in many ways, each of which has been supplied with a descriptive term. Floor of mouth, the floor of the oral cavity proper frequently possesses bony swellings along the lingual surface of the mandible known as mandibular tori. Additional bony exostoses may be present on the buccal surface of the mandible in the vicinity of the alveolar processes. The tori present radiographic opacity, whereas the buccal exostoses seldom demonstrate radiographic change. Neither of the two conditions presents problems, except in denture construction when they must be removed surgically. Difficulty may be encountered in placing films for dental radiographs and in preparing study models. A retracuspid papilla, a small papule, may often be observed on the lingual gingiva adjacent to the mandibular cuspid. Such a papilla is not clinically significant. The mucoperiosteum displays some specializations in its surface, especially anteriorly. <laughs>
a median palatine raphe, the developmental fusion of the palatine shelves, may be observed on the hard palate. Located in the midline of the palate, immediately behind the central incisors, lies a small, oval-shaped surface prominence termed the incisive papilla. This structure covers the oral opening of the incisive canal through which the nasopalatine nerves and nasopalatine arteries are transmitted to the anterior palate. It is an important landmark for anesthesia of the anterior palate. Posterior to this region is a series of transverse folds that appear to radiate from the incisive papilla. These folds are the palatine rugae, which are vestigial in humans but may serve accessory masticating and special sensory functions in some lower animals. Lateral to this area of the palate and beneath the covering mucosa is the fatty region. Moving posteriorly, the fatty region is replaced by a glandular region, housing the mucus, minor palatine glands extending into the soft palate. Near the midline and just posterior to the hard palate is the palatine fovea, a small depression or pit that receives the ducts of some of the palatine glands of the hard and soft palates. Palate, the developmental defect of greatest concern to the dental profession is the cleft palate. Isolated incidence is in the vicinity of in 2500 birth in the United States. The normal shape of the palate is classically described as vault-like, but this varies in individuals from narrow to wide, flat, or high, and so on. Frequently, one may observe a midline bulge in the palate resulting from excess bone growth. This is termed palatine torus and presents no problem except during denture construction, at which time it must be removed surgically. Whenever anesthetic injections are to be administered in the palate they should be given, if possible, in an area away from the mucoperiosteum. If an injection must be given in the area covered by mucoperiosteum, hard palate, care must be exercised and the injection must be given slowly to prevent tearing of the collagenous bundles away from the bone. The palate is formed by the fusion of the intermaxillary segment with the two lateral palatine processes of the maxillae. This fusion is initiated early in development and serves to separate the common oronasal cavity into separate nasal and oral cavities, thus limiting their communication only through the pharynx. Teeth Teeth are arranged on the maxillary and mandibular arches. They articulate with their counterpart on the opposing arch and during occlusion, and when they do that they separate the oral cavity proper from the vestibule. The teeth are arranged in a row on both the maxillary and the mandibular dental arches. They form a boundary between the vestibule and the oral cavity proper. As discussed previously, the gingiva of the vestibule and the oral cavity proper become continuous in the interdental spaces. The permanent teeth are named similarly on each side and in the two arches. There are two incisors, one canine cuspid, two premolars bicuspid, and three molars, thus, Eight teeth are in each quadrant of the jaw, for a total complement of 32 teeth. This is the normal complement of teeth found in a mature adult. The third molar, wisdom tooth, is often slow to erupt and may not present itself in the oral cavity. Occasionally it is congenitally absent, thereby reducing the total complement of teeth. Deciduous teeth, as the name implies, are those that are eventually shed or replaced. Thus they represent the complement of teeth present in childhood. Each quadrant contains the following deciduous teeth, two incisors, one canine, and two molars. The molars occupy the same position as will the permanent premolas, thus, there are five deciduous teeth in each quadrant for a total of 20 teeth. The two dentitions, deciduous and permanent, may be expressed in a dental formula as in the following diagrams, the teeth develop from substances elaborated by certain layers of the primitive oral ectoderm and certain specialized cells of the ectomesenchyme. As the teeth develop, the alveolar processes of the maxilla and mandible form the bony socket surrounding it. The tooth is anchored in its alveolus by a calcified tissue, the cementum, and a soft tissue, the periodontal ligament. The clinical crown of the tooth is that part exposed in the oral cavity, whereas the root lies in the bony alveolus, out of view. Enamel overly stentin in the crown, where it terminates just below the gingival line at the neck. The dentin in the root is overlaid by the cementum, which anchors the tooth to the bone via the periodontal ligaments.
The central core of the tooth is composed of the soft tissue pulp containing blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics that reach the area through the apical foramen at the tip of the root. The tooth has an occlusal surface that contacts the same surface of its counterpart on the opposing dental arch on closure of the mouth. Buccal surface and lingual surface refer to the vestibular surface and the oral cavity proper surface, respectively. The incisa eye edge is the cutting edge of the anterior teeth. The premolas and molars possess cusps, raised knobs on the occlusal surface. Also, because embryologically the teeth form from the midline laterally, the surface that most closely approximates the midline is considered to be the mesial aspect, that which is in the opposite direction is the distal aspect. Odontogenesis, odontogenesis, the development of teeth, begins in the middle of the sixth week of gestation. Although a continuous process, it is arbitrarily subdivided into various stages. These are the bud, cap, and bell stages, followed by apposition, root formation, and eruption. The basal layer of the ectodermally derived presumptive oral epithelium of the stomatium undergoes proliferation, both on the maxillary and mandibular arches, along the region of the future dental arches, forming a horseshoe shaped band of ectodermal tissue, the dental lamina surrounded by neural crest-derived ectomesenchyme. The epithelially derived cells are separated from the underlying and surrounding connective tissue element by a thin acellular layer the basement membrane. Dud stage Along with the formation of the dental lamina, ten round epithelial structures, each referred to as a bud, develop at the distal aspect of the dental lamina of each arch. These correspond to the ten deciduous teeth of each dental arch, and they signify the bud stage of tooth development. Each bud is separated from the ectomesenchyme by a basement membrane. Ectomesenchymal cells congregate deep to the bud, forming a cluster of cells, which is the initiation of the condensation of the ectomesenchyme. The remaining ectomesenchymal cells are arranged in a more or less haphazardly uniform fashion. Cap stage, cells of the inferior aspect of each tooth bud proliferate, forming a larger, more expanded structure, the cap. The cap is said to be composed of an epithelially derived enamel organ, which is separated by the basement membrane, from a condensation of ectomesenchymal cells, known as the dental papilla. Enamel origin, the cells in the core of the enamel organ are known as the stellate reticulum. It is completely enveloped by the two regions of a single layer of epithelial cells, the squamous to low cuboidal shaped outer enamel epithelium IOE, and the cuboidal to low columnar shaped inner enamel epithelium, IE. They contact each other at the rim shaped cervical loop, which represents the presumptive cervix of the future tooth. Some cells of the stellate reticulum form a group of flattened cells, known as the enamel knot, R and knot. The dental papilla, the future pulp of the tooth, fills the concavity of the enamel organ. It is composed of a vascularized embryonic connective tissue whose mesenchymal cells are derived from neural crest. The dental follicle, dental SAE, is a membranous structure that surrounds the tooth germ. It will give rise to the periodontal ligament, cementum, and alveolus. The succedaneous lamina, a cord-like epithelial band, arises from each enamel organ and will give rise to the enamel organ of that permanent tooth which will replace the deciduous tooth presently being formed. This permanent tooth germ will also go through the same stages of odontogenesis, but at a later date than its deciduous counterpart. Bell stage, mitotic activity of the enamel organ enlarges the structure and form a new cell layer the stratum intermeridium. The enlarged structure resemble a bell hence the ball stage of tooth development. The cell layers of the inner enamel epithelium elongated and become tall columnar cells. Because of this histologic change, the stage is said to be the stage of histodifferentiation. Additionally, the entire bell-shaped enamel organ changes its morphology to form the template for the future tooth. Therefore, the bell stage is also said to be the stage of morphodifferentiation. Enamel knot. The process of morphodifferentiation is responsible for the establishment of the teri plate of the presumptive tooth, that is, the enamel organ will assume the shape of an incisiform, caniniform, or molariform tooth. It has been recently discovered that this event is controlled by the enamel knot, R and knot.
it appears that the ectomesenchymal cells of the dental papilla induce the cells of the enamel knot to begin to express signaling molecules, thus transforming the enamel knot into one of the principal signaling centers of tooth morphogenesis. Origin of the permanent molars, the posterior regions of the upper and lower dental laminae elongate and each newly elongated region forms three buds, the three permanent molars of each quadrant, for which no deciduous counterparts exist. Therefore, these twelve permanent molars are referred to as accessional teeth. The tall, columnar cells of the dental papilla, the preodontoblasts, begin to elaborate a collagen-rich substance known as dentin matrix, and these cells are now referred to as odontoblasts. The initial layer of dentin matrix is different from the remainder of the dentin matrix of the tooth and is referred to as mantle dentin. In response to the formation of mantle dentin, the premaloblasts become ameloblasts and secrete the first layer of enamel matrix. Since this very first layer of enamel matrix differs from most of the enamel matrix of the tooth, it is referred to as oprismatic enamel matrix. Thus, the dentino enamel junction has just been established in a very small region of the developing tooth germ. Odontoblasts retreat on a daily basis, and they apparently move approximately 4 to 8 pm per day. During this motion they elaborate dentin matrix. As oprismat 1c enamel matrix is B1ng formed, the ameloblasts retreat, as did the odontoblasts, but in the opposite direction. As they move away from the odontoblasts, each forms a short, blunt tomes process and manufactures enamel matrix around this process. As the enamel matrix is secreted, the ameloblast withdraws its tomes process, leaving a space in the enamel matrix, known as rod space, which quickly becomes filled with enamel matrix, and a small block of enamel matrix is known as a rod segment. Every day, each ameloblast manufactures a single rod segment, these rod segments are placed on top of one another, forming an enamel rod, enamel prism. Because of these rod segments, the enamel formed is known as prismatic enamel. Root formation, root formation begins when dentinogenesis and amelogenesis approach the cervical loop. Possibly influenced by the presence of enamel and dentin near the cervical loop, this structure begins to undergo mitosis and grows in an apical direction as an epithelial cylinder that surrounds the dental papilla. This epithelial cylinder, the Hertwig epithelial root sheath, is composed of two layers of cells, an outer and an inner layer, derived from the outer enamel epithelium and the inner enamel epithelium, respectively. Because of the absence of a stellate reticulum and stratum intermedium, the inner layer of the Hertwig epithelial root sheath will not form enamel. However, these cells will provide signaling molecules that will cause the peripheral layer of cells of the dental papilla to differentiate into odontoblasts and elaborate dentin matrix. These cells will also form, on the surface of mantle dentin, an enamel-like hyalin layer of Hopewell Smith, a substance that facilitates the adherence of cementum to the radicular dentin. Radicular dentinogenesis Radicular dentin formation is semi one ar to cozerta t dentin formation in that there is a layer of mantle dentin matrix formed first. The bulk of radicular dentin, known as circumpulpal dentin, is manufactured similarly to its coronal counterpart. Cell rests of malice. Subsequent to the formation of the hyaline layer of Hopewell Smith, the Hertwig epithelial root sheath, which was composed of two continuous layers of epithelial cells, begins to undergo partial degeneration. It becomes a network of epithelial cords surrounding the root of the tooth, and is called the rest cells of malice. Cementoblasts. Ectomesenchymal cells, derived from the dental follicle, pass through the discontinuities among the network of epithelial cords and, proceeding between the newly formed dentin and the now incomplete inner layer of the Hertwig epithel 1 al root sheath, differentiate into cementoblasts. The cementoblasts manufacture cementum matrix, which mineralizes to become cementum. Detailed information regarding developmental processes, as well as information on the complex anatomy and function of the individual teeth, is available in texts of oral histology, embryology, and dental anatomy. Pharynx, the muscular pharynx is a mucosal line tube attached to the base of the cranium, causing inferiorly to become continuous with the esophagus.
It serves as an airway to the larynx and as a passageway for food and drink to the esophagus. The pharynx is a muscular tube lined with mucous membrane. It extends in an inferior direction from the base of the cranium to the level of the sixth cervical vertebra, where it becomes continuous with the esophagus. The pharynx possesses several attachments along its length, therefore, its mobility is somewhat restricted. The pharynx lies behind the nasal cavity, oral cavity, and larynx. Although its posterior wall presents a continuous surface, superiorly its anterior wall is interrupted by the coenae of the nasal cavity and the isthmus of the oral cavity. Thus, the pharynx serves to conduct air to the larynx from the nasal and oral cavities as well as food to the esophagus from the mouth. The muscular wall of the pharynx is composed of three overlapping muscles, originating from several anatomic structures in their vicinity and all inserting into a longitudinal line, the posterior median raphe, in the dorsal wall of the pharynx. The three muscles are the superior pharyngeal, middle pharyngeal, and inferior pharyngeal constrictors, each named for its relative location. Each muscle possesses fibers that ascend and descend from their origin to be inserted into the raphe. This fanned out arrangement provides for a strong but flexible multilayered wall whose muscle fibers course in a direction oblique to each other. The pharynx, for purposes of description, is divided into three anatomic regions, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngeal pharynx. The most superior portion, the nasopharynx, begins at the superior attachment to the sphenoid and occipital bones and ends at the soft palate. This is the widest part of the pharynx and is in communication with the nasal cavity via the coenae and with the middle ear cavity via the auditory tube eustachian tube. A fold of mucous membrane, in the area of the auditory tube, covers the salpingopharyngeus muscle, which blends into the pharyngeal wall. In the pharyngeal recess, behind the lip of the auditory tube, is the pharyngeal tonsil. During swallowing, the nasopharynx is sealed off from the oral cavity by the elevation of the soft palate superiorly and posteriorly against the posterior and lateral walls of the pharynx. This may be observed dermuth, protrude the tongue, and say ah. This causes the palate to be elevated and permits observation of the oropharynx extending from the palate to the larynx. The lateral wall of the pharynx is formed by the palatopharyngeal fold covering the palatopharyngeus muscle. This fold, arising from the soft palate, is also called the posterior pyilar of the fosses, also called the posterior pyilar of the fosses, whereas the fold anterior to this, the palatoglossal fold, is also called the anterior pillar of the fosses. Whereas the fold anterior to this, the palatoglossal fold, is also called the anterior pillar of the fosses. This fold is not a part of the lateral wall of the pharynx, rather, it is the fold that covers the palatoglossal muscle, one of the extrinsic muscles of the tongue lies in the pharynx. Inferiorly, the epiglottis projects into the oral pharynx behind the tongue, separated by two small pouches, valleculi, located on either side of the epiglottis. A more thorough discussion of the pharynx is found in regional descriptions that follow in Chapter 16. Oropharynx Small clumps of lymphoid tissue surround the entry into the deep portions of the digestive tract at the oropharynx. This lymphatic ring of walled ira is well developed in the child and regresses with advancing age. It is possible to view the posterior nasal coenae, the auditory tubes, and the larynx during an oral examination by illuminating the oropharynx and using a dental mirror. On examination of the oropharynx, a ridge of tissue on the posterior pharyngeal wall may be observed on a plane with the soft palate. This ridge, known as the passivant bar, represents the contact zone between the pharynx and the palate when it is elevated for sealing off the nasopharynx from the oropharynx.